Hello everybody. Just wanted to take a little time to go over some of the basic concepts and distinctions within logic and philosophical argumentation. Um, we want to have a good idea of how to make arguments, what the basic components of them are, but also how to evaluate them. So we deal with arguments all um, all the time in our lives, right? We make arguments for what we ought to do, we make arguments for what to eat for lunch, we make arguments with friends, we make arguments on all sorts of decisions that we uh, that we take, right? So we want to be able to have a clear idea of what it means to say that an argument is good, how we evaluate the arguments that we're being given, and what are some of the kind of basic components for that. So to start off with, a statement is the fundamental building block for all arguments, all of the kinds of sentences that you're going to be using and working on um, when you evaluate an argument or when you make an argument of your own, they're going to be statements. So the first thing to get clear about is what is a statement? And a statement is a sentence used to make a claim that is capable of being true or false. Now not all sentences or phrases of speech are statements, right? They should kind of go without question. Uh, questions, commands, requests, exclamations, greetings, all these other things these aren't statements because it doesn't make sense to ask the question, is this true or false, right? So if we get a question, it doesn't make it a statement because what does it mean to say, well, is that question true or false, right? Compare that to one of these other statements, right? Alan is broke and he is unhappy, right? We can say, is that true or false? And it makes sense. So we already have a kind of intuitive grammatical distinction between statements and not statements, right? And it, it works on this kind of idea that statements are trying to tell you something about the world or about the way you are or something is, right? It's making a claim, in other words, that can be evaluated as true or false. Um, other kinds of um, se sentences and gra grammatical structures, they're trying to do something else, right? They're trying to gain information, they're trying to just get you to do something, or some other kind of purpose or function that they serve, right? And there are two kinds of statements that are involved in an argument. There are premises and there are conclusions, right? So we have the premises, which are the reasons given for why something ought to be the case, and the conclusion is what those premises are trying to show ought to be the case, right? Con the conclusion is what you're trying to get your reader or the person you're talking to to agree with and believe, right? So um, you have to be able to distinguish between the two of those to start with, right? So let's do a little practice in evaluating and finding out the premises and the conclusions, right? And you can go ahead and do this uh, with me if you'd like, right, in the video. So we can look at this example. The Wall Street Journal says that people should invest heavily in stocks. They are a reputable newspaper in regard to financial advice. Therefore, investing in stocks is a smart move. When you're looking for arguments, you want to take as the first step finding the conclusion. And in many cases, you're not going to be just looking at a small paragraph like this or a short thing. You're going to be looking at a whole <laughs> multi-page thing where lots of information is being given. Some of it's data, some of it's um, other claims, some of it's like frivolous, irrelevant uh, state, uh, statements or, or sentences, right? So to be able to sift through all of this, um, you need to be able to first identify well, what's the conclusion that's being given, right? What's the main conclusion? Or And sometimes this is phrased as the thesis, right? What is this paper trying to convince me of or this essay trying to convince me of? So what's the conclusion? What's the thesis, right? And then from there, you can look at the different sentences and the different statements being given, and you can say, okay, this seems like something they're trying to use as proof or reason to believe, reason to accept, the conclusion that I identified already, right? So we want to be able to figure out the conclusion first and foremost. That's the first step. So in this case, we already have what's called a conclusion indicator, which is this word, therefore, right? Um, other words like so, thus, um, these are in called conclusion indicators, right? They are words that tell us that what follows is actually is the conclusion, right? It's what is meant to be the claim that you accept afterwards, right? 
So the conclusion here is investing in stocks is a smart move. Now that means that these other two sentences, because they're making claims, because they are statements, they are premises. They are the reasons for why the conclusion should be accepted, according to whoever wrote this example, right? All right, so another one here. Nobody should believe anything that a redhead tweets. Lindsay Lohan is a redhead, at least originally, so we shouldn't believe her tweets. So where do you think the conclusion is? And you can go ahead and pause the video here if you want to think about it for a little bit. But the conclusion here, look at, look for the conclusion indicator first, right? And we see the word so. Okay, so we shouldn't believe her tweets. That seems like the conclusion then, right? That's what this person who's saying this wants us to take away from um, the statements and stuff that they talk about, right? The other claims are um, premises, right? They're reasons that, they're, that are being given for why we should accept the conclusion, right? All right, famous one, if you, if you recognize this one, then you've heard of what's called the liar paradox. Uh, I am a liar. Since liars cannot be trusted to speak the truth, you shouldn't believe anything I say. So interestingly enough, this, this is a paradoxical claim to start off with, but what we want to first do is um, identify the conclusion. And, um, so go ahead and pause the video if you want to try and think about it and come up with your answer for sec here if you want. But this is a tricky one because there's no clear conclusion indicator word. You might think that the word since is a conclusion indicator, but it is actually what we call a premise indicator. Because when we use the word since, we're actually indicating a reason being given for something. Since functions, grammatically speaking, similarly to because. Right? So when you say a sentence, I'm a liar because blah, 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 blah. Well, the conclusion isn't what follows the because. The conclusion is what becomes comes before the because. Right? It, the because is giving you the reason for the previous statement. Right? So the conclusion here is you shouldn't believe anything I say. Right? And we could reformulate this whole sentence saying, you shouldn't believe anything I say because liars cannot be trusted to speak the truth and I am a liar, right? So that's that's where we get the conclusion in that one. And um, the paradox here is interesting uh, because what it gives us is a kind of strange uh, situation where if I'm telling the truth, then it's false. And if I'm lying, then it's true, right? Because if it says I am a liar, and I actually am a liar, then I'm telling the truth, and I'm not a liar anymore, right? Or at least not in this case, right? But if I'm lying about being a liar, then I'm telling the truth, right? And so if I'm telling you false things, the whole <laughs> proposition is true, right? But if I'm telling you true things, the whole proposition is false. It's a really interesting problem in logic. And um, if you want to take a logic class, we can we'll go over some kind of paradox, paradoxes like this, and we can evaluate how we kind of set this up and what it means to say a proposition or an argument is true or false. We can evaluate arguments and come to kind of pretty conclusive um, answers or uh, conclusive um claims about whether an argument is sound, um, whether it's uh, uh, valid, whether it's um, true or false, right? We can do this thing called a truth table, right? Um, but if you're interested in that, uh, we have a philosophy 230 class that you can take, um, and we will go over all sorts of stuff like that. So that's some practice with um, premise and conclusion identification. And you'll want to work on that when we're going through the arguments in the book. Um, that's going to be a really good skill to have developed no, no matter where you go, right? Um, even if you don't go into philosophy specifically, um, being able to identify the conclusion in a business report, right? Or a project 
um, uh, abstract or something like that. Being able to identify the conclusion, the reasons, and support of something, that's going to be um, valuable widespread in any kind of career path or life <laughs> uh, path that you choose, right? So um, moving on here a little bit, oftentimes you won't have an argument really clearly laid out just step by step um, and just have it very kind of simple, straightforward, and clearly there, right? You might even not have some of the claims being made explicitly, right? There might be what are called implicit claims or premises, or or the conclusion might not even be explicitly stated. You might have to um, what we call restructure the argument, right? And we often have to do this, and this is a good practice to do anyways. Like when you're when you're evaluating an argument, it's worthwhile to restructure the argument in your own head because we oft, we often we do this, but we do it very quickly. Whenever somebody else tells us an argument or makes claims to us, right, we restructure their argument in our own head so that we understand what they're saying and then respond, right? Now, we do that process so quickly that we might not realize that we're doing it, but we do actually go through this process, right? Um, a problem, though, if you've ever had like a miscommunication or a misunderstanding with someone, where that lies is how we, re how we restructure their argument, right? They gave us claims, and we understood them to be making this kind of argument when they're actually making a totally different kind of point, right? Or they're not bringing in implications that we thought they were or would have to, right? So being able to look, if there's miscommunication or misunderstanding happening between two people, being able to go back and say, okay, so here's how I was understanding the point you were making. Is that accurate? Is that kind of what you're trying to say, right? That's a really um, fundamental and important skill to have, right? So um, restructuring arguments, this is a really important thing to do. Um, and it's when we evaluate an argument, we try to see how it works, and we're put, kind of putting it, putting the pieces together ourselves, right? And then we can evaluate if we've done that um, accurately, if we've represented the argument accurately or not, right? So let's take a look at this kind of example here. Since private property helps people define themselves, since it frees people from mundane cares of daily subsistence, and since it is in, it is fin is finite, excuse me. No individual should accumulate so much property that others are prevented from accumulating the necessities of life. All right, so from our earlier discussion, you can you know that since is, an, is a premise indicator word, right? So where's the conclusion? That's the first question. What is the conclusion, right? If you want to take a second pause and try to figure it out yourself, well, there's really only one, be, since, since, <laughs> There's three senses here already included. We're already kind of left with just one left statement, right? One statement remaining. No individual should accumulate so much property that others are prevented from accumulating the necessities of life, right? So, and then these statements are all reasons in favor of this conclusion, right? So those are all premises, right? And we can just write them out, right? We can just write them out, premise one, premise two, premise three, and then conclusion, right? We can represent or restructure the argument that way. And sometimes that's very helpful to just kind of get it clearly laid out as to what's supporting what, right? And so we could just have something like this, premise one, private property helps people define themselves. Premise two, private property feel, frees people from mundane cares of daily subsistence. Premise three, the resources that one can own are finite. And then the conclusion, therefore, no individual should be allowed to accumulate property to the extent that it prevents others from accumulating the necessity of life. Right? So we get that conclusion, and this is how the argument is supposed to flow. And then now we can look back at it and say, okay, if this argument is flawed, there's two ways in which it is flawed. It's either flawed in these premises don't actually justify, they don't actually lend support to this claim, this statement here, right? No individual should be allowed, that statement there. That can happen, and in many cases it, it can be pretty obvious, right? Because it seems like this is totally irrelevant to what these premises are talking about. That's a case where we have um, 
a kind of a kind of gap between the premises and the conclusion, right? Um, other cases might not be so obvious, right? It might sound like or seem like kind of intuitively, oh yeah, these things actually have an impact on this conclusion. They're they're relevant, but if we look a little deeper, they might not actually be relevant, right? So um, that's one way in which an argument can go wrong. The second way an argument can go wrong is that even if these three premises do make this conclusion more likely to be true, and that's what we mean when philosophers or people talk about premises supporting a conclusion, what they mean is that this claim, if it's true, makes the conclusion more likely to be true, right? It enhances or increases the likelihood of the conclusion be being true, right? Um, when these might be just false, right? Or, or not true, right? So even if these do support the conclusion, these might be false. One of these premises might be false. And if the conclusion requires all three of these to be true to really make the case, to make this be true, then that's a problem for the conclusion, right? So two ways in which an argument can go wrong, right? You can either have a gap between the premises and the conclusion where they don't actually help support the conclusion. They're not relevant, really. Or two, the, the premises do support or are relevant to the conclusion, but one of them is flawed. One of the premises is not true, right? This is, thinking of it in this way is very different to how you might usually have an argument with someone because what usually happens, or not usually, but in a lot of cases what happens is our automatic impulse is to disagree with the conclusion, right? It's to hear the conclusion and say, no, that's false, right? Because of this other argument, right? When you do that, you actually leave the debate and dialogue on the argument itself and go to something else, right? And so you haven't actually explained what's wrong with the argument itself. You've just given a different argument for a separate and different conclusion, maybe an opposing conclusion, right? But that's avoiding the argument that's being given, right? When we have somebody tell us an argument, what we do is we have to show where the argument goes wrong in order to show that the argument is flawed, right? So it's we can't just say, oh, here's the argument, here's the conclusion, I don't like that conclusion, or I don't agree with it, so it's false, and then give a different argument. That's not the way to do, about, uh, to do it, right? To, that's not the way we ought to have arguments and debates, right? Um, what you have to do is you have to show the error in the argument itself. Because if a conclusion is false or flawed, or if an argument is flawed, you, there has to be some error in the argument itself, right? If there's no error in the argument, then it seems like it's a good argument, right? So we have, so in order to make the distinction between a bad argument and a good argument, bad arguments always have some kind of error in them, right? So we, ha we need to be able to point that out, and that's what we should be doing when we're making arguments. All right, so I'm going to talk about just come some some impediments to philosophical thinking, right? Um, and this is kind of where we can go wrong in dealing with arguments or hearing arguments or um, engaging with our in arguments with other people, right? Um, sometimes we make bad arguments because we're just kind of we're too committed to a view <laughs> or too committed to a claim to really be able to evaluate it on its own merits, right? We're too kind of like, oh, I deeply, deeply believe this, and there's nothing you can tell me that can change my mind, right? Well, that sound that might sound admirable, but it's actually a, a way in which people can be lured into um, false beliefs or to believing in illusions, right? I mean, some people used to say that about like their, their beliefs about slavery, right? That there's no way that you can prove that slavery is wrong, right? Not to me, at least. Well, if that's the case, then there's no point in talking to you or talking to any to the person about why slavery is wrong. There's no way to get a better view, right, and get a more accurate and true view, right, 
if you're dogmatically committed, right? And dogma here just means that you are committed to a belief regardless of its um, rational value, right? Its coherency, its consistency, its um, evidence, right? If you're not interested in any of that for why you hold a belief, then it's a dogmatic belief, right? You just have to hold it because, just because, right? <laughs> There's no explanation for it, right? So self-interested thinking, that can get in the way of doing philosophy and thinking philosophically. Um, peer pressure, that can get in the way, right? Where we kind of just stop thinking, honestly. Peer pressure is where our psychology kind of takes over our rationality and leads us to maybe not speak up when we want to, or it leads us to agree to things when we don't actually believe them to be true. Um, there's this famous uh, study of behavior, of human behavior, where they have a group of maybe five or six random participants, um, one of whom is actually a random participant and is really the experiment um, subject. And then the other people are plants, but they're all meant to look like they're just random people from for a focus group. And what the experimenter does is they put up, um, they have the people vote and um, agree on certain positions or certain claims about whether something's true or false, right? And it's largely mathematic, right? Or basic claims, right? So they have them go around and they offer these, um, they have them go through some basic ones, two plus two equals four. Every, everyone goes around the table. Yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah, that's true. I believe that. Um, human dignity is important. Yeah, yeah, I believe that. Yeah, everybody goes. But then they have some slides where, like, they'll have seven plus five equals 12. Or, sorry, seven plus five equals 13. Now, that's mathematically false, but they have the plants in the room, the people who are planted there, they have them say, yep, I believe that, yep, I believe that, yep, I believe that, yep, I... and then they get to the experiment subject. And in a lot of cases, the experiment subject agrees with the majority of people, even though it's a false claim, <laughs> even though if they just added, they would realize, no, it's false. And here's the thing, they might actually believe that that's false, but because of peer pressure, they might agree with the group right they might hold they might hold fast with the group rather than um contrast them right or disagree with the group so peer pressure is a real thing and it has important implications on how we make decisions and how we um how we think publicly perhaps right and we always want to be on the lookout for places where we come into that contact with that kind of pressure, right? Because um, arguments are not hostile. I mean, they don't have to be hostile. They don't have to be combative, right? That happens when people aren't really interested in having a discussion or an argument in the philosophical sense. They just want to prove a point or make themselves look um, important or better than somebody else, right? That's an ego-driven thing, right? But when we have people who really want to figure something out, well, that's fundamentally collaborative. That's fundamentally about cooperation. We're all trying to figure out how to make sense of this thing. And so if that's what we're doing, then we are engaged in a process that works together with everybody, right? And so there's no reason to think of asking a question or posing a problem as combative or like calling someone out or something like that, right? Um, worst case scenario, the person, well, I don't even know what the worst case scenario would be like. The, either it will lead to enlightenment on one end or the other, right? Either you misunderstood what the claim was or what its implications were, and now you have a better idea after raising the question, or they misunderstood, and now they might have a better understanding of the claim or its implications, right? So it just seems like what we get from asking questions and and raising um, uh, arguments against something or evaluating arguments is enlightenment. <laughs> we get better understanding on one one side or the other or both sides, right? So um, 
but peer pre peer pressure is a real phenomena that has psychological import, right? And so is stereotyping, right? We we fall prey to stereotyping a lot. And I, look, our the human brain, the human mind is built to make quick judgments, quick decisions. That's part of survival, right? You can't just take a long time thinking about something and then make a decision, right? In 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 the wild or in life, in in, in many cases, you have to make a very quick judgment call to decide what to do. So our brains rely on generalizations to make such calls but we ought to be aware of when our minds are using that and when it might not be accurate or helpful to do that right um, and that's where we fall into kind of stereotyping right and it's not just stereotyping through race or gender but it might be stereotyping based on um, expectations of a job right or stereotyping based on the expectations of I don't know, owning a certain vehicle, right? And these stereotypes might lead us into making flawed decisions, right? I mean, if you've ever heard the kind of grass is always greener on the other side um, kind of illusion, right? Well, that's because we set up a kind of stereotype or a generalization about how this other job has this and this and this and this and it's so much better. When if we take that job or something, then we might lose out on some of the other things that were great about the job we had, right? And those benefits that we thought might be so incredible or great, they're really not that amazing when you actually get into the job. So stereotyping and generalizing is can be problematic. It's something that we can't escape, but it's something that we ought to be aware of when we're doing it so that we can make better judgments about what's um, really accurate and valuable in those cases, right? Um, a couple of other impediments, things things that can get in the way of philosophical thinking. Um, subjective relativism is is one of these, and it's on this list. It's it's probably a view that many of you have not really come across, and it has to do with the nature of truth, right? So to say that truth is relative means that what what is true doesn't depend on factors outside of human psychology, to put it broadly. If you're a subjective relativist, then it means that truth is dependent on simply what you individually believe, right? This is not really the common sense idea of truth that we operate on a day-to-day -day basis. We don't really believe that if my office ex my office exists or doesn't exist, just whether I believe it does or does not. If I believe my office doesn't exist right now when I'm recording this video, if truth is subjectively relative, then my office doesn't exist, right? Even if you're seeing me in my office right now. <laughs> so we usually think, no, 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 you can be wrong about your beliefs, right? So truth and what's true isn't simply up to whatever you think individually, right? Um, and so we might have this inclination in certain cases, certain times, to when we're dealing with a tough argument or we're, when we're confronted with a, a conclusion that we don't particularly like or that makes us kind of like, oh, man, that's not really what I used to believe, but maybe there's reason for it. It, that's okay to be uncomfortable. Um, the thing you don't want to fall into is, well, everyone has their own belief. Like, whatever it is, whatever. <laughs> beliefs are beliefs, right? Well, I mean, that might be true, but you you stopped engaging in the argument, right? And it's perfectly fine to say, hmm, I'm not sure what to think about this right now. Perhaps... Um, I will need a little bit of time to think through it more and come up with um, why I don't quite accept this conclusion that you're giving me or any kind of other problems that I have with the arguments you've, you've uh, given. That's perfectly fine. You can suspend judgment, right, um, and take your time to think through things. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem is when we kind of just say we have this kind of knee-jerk reaction to kind of um, refuse, again, like with the self-interested thinking, refuse to engage with an argument because it makes us uncomfortable or makes makes us question things that we deeply believed or 
um, might have believed without realizing that we believe them, right? Um, the beliefs that we should hold are the ones that have good reason to do so, right? And subjective relativism is an impediment in the sense that it prevents us from really engaging with arguments. When we always have this backdoor to just say, well, truth is just relative to each person, then I don't really have to take seriously any arguments other people give me. I'm infallible <laughs> by definition with this position, right? I can't be wrong because whatever I believe is the case is the case, right? So um, there's no way that you could prove my position wrong on this on this view. But that, and the problem there is that I don't have to collaborate. I don't have to cooperate. I don't have to work with other people to find the truth. I have it in whatever I believe, regardless of what that is, right? So subjective relativism cuts us off from really engaging with arguments, but also with other people and trying to figure out the truth, right? Um, and, that's a, and that's a real problem to doing philosophy because philosophy has a fundamental kind of dialogical element to it. It's about dialogue. It's about discussion. It's about conversation between people. Um, and then the last one here on the list is uh, social relativism, right? Um, so not just subjective relativism, but if, but if truth is just simply relative to your culture, well then all I need to do to figure out truth is ask what my culture believes. And I don't have to go any further, right? I don't even have to ask whether what my culture believes is true, right? That doesn't make any sense if social relativism is true, um, is the accurate position. And then here we kind of get the paradox of these two positions as well, right? If we ask the question, are these positions true? It seems to presuppose an objective account of morality or some account of, or sorry, objective account of truth. Some account of truth that goes beyond our culture saying what is true or not, or just what I say is true or not, right? It has to be of the world. Truth just works this way in and of itself, right? Um, so there's a kind of paradox or a kind of contradiction within these two positions um, about truth kind of in and of themselves because they rely on an objective account of truth in order to even say that they are true in the first place, right? So we're kind of committed in a certain sense to an objective account of truth, to truth being independent of our preferences and independent of our cultures, right? That it's a kind of fact of the world, right? And when we talk about scientific truths, this seems to be the case, right? The shape of the earth is a certain way, whether or not you're a flat earther or a round earther, right? Um, the shape of the earth is a certain way. It doesn't depend on our belief, right? Our beliefs should depend on the way the things are. That's, that's the right direction that we should try and have, right? So these are all different impediments to philosophical thinking. They can keep us from doing philosophy in an accurate way, right? Or in a helpful, productive way, honestly. Um, so I have this four-step procedure here for identifying and assessing arguments. Um, and you can use this if you'd like. The biggest thing to focus on, at least for this class, is trying to, to find the conclusion of the argument and then identify the premises used to support the conclusion. This step one is really key, right? This other stuff you can incorporate as well and it'll give you a good, a good way of evaluating arguments. But the biggest thing is to first find the conclusion and then identify the premises from there, right? Um, it's worth mentioning that there are two types of arguments, generally speaking. There are deductive arguments and there are inductive arguments, right? So we have deductive arguments where the conclusion is necessarily true, given that the premises are true. And these are really, really strong and powerful arguments. If you have a deductive argument, you have a really, really strong and powerful argument in favor of the conclusion, right? Because where the conclusion is necessarily true, given that the premises are true, right? So if you have true premises and you have a deductive argument, you necessarily have a true conclusion, right? And so let's look at a couple examples here. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is a mortal. This is a necessarily, necessarily true conclusion given that the premises are true, 
and the conclusion follows from the premises, right? This argument is deductive. It tries to guarantee, give you a guaranteed conclusion with the reasons given for it, right? Um, that's the nature of all deductive arguments. They're very, very strong, right? They're very, very strong, very powerful. They're very difficult to formulate, right? A lot of our world doesn't give us certainty in our conclusions this way, right? But there are some claims that have to be the case given other um, reasons in favor of them, right? And so whenever you're dealing with an argument that tries to establish the conclusion as necessarily true, or this has to be the, the way it is, you're dealing with a deductive argument, right? And this is contrasted with the other type of arguments, which are inductive, right? When we're dealing with inductive arguments, we are looking at arguments that have a likelihood of where the conclusion is true. They are probabilistically true, right, conclusions. And it, it's a type of argument where certainty just kind of isn't really possible in this way, right? But you can get a very, very high degree of likelihood, right? So whenever we make scientific arguments, through hypotheses and testing out the hypotheses and coming to a conclusion about them, we're always dealing with inductive arguments, right? And the reason why is because there's always the possibility that there's an entirely different kind of explanation for the phenomena that we experience, right? Um, all scientific experiments are inductive in this way, right? And that's because the conclusions could be consistent with a very different um, explanation, right, that we just haven't thought of yet, perhaps, right? So, um, oftentimes when we're dealing with data and arguing that the data means this and the data or the experiment shows us this, we're dealing with inductive arguments, right? So let's do a little practice here, um, distinguishing between de deductive and inductive arguments. So we can start with this claim, all dogs have fleas, Bowser is the dog, Therefore, Bowser has fleas. So is this a deductive or inductive argument? You can pause the video here if you want to take a chance to uh, guess. The argument here is deductive, right? Because it's giving you a um, guaranteed conclusion if the premises are true, right? So you ask, OK, assume that these premises are true. Would the conclusion also necessarily be true, right? And yes, it would be, right? If, if all dogs have fleas, right? If every single thing that's a dog has fleas and Bowser is a dog, then Bowser would necessarily have fleas. The problem with this argument is not in its structure. It's a valid argument, we, we say. It's that the first premise is false. It's not true that all dogs have fleas, right? And so the deductive argument can't follow, or the deduct deductive conclusion can't follow because of that, right? But structurally, it's a absolutely guaranteed conclusion with this argument, right? So it's deductive. What about this one? All dogs are mammals, all cows are mammals, therefore all dogs are cows. This is also a deductive argument. Now, you might be saying, but the conclusion is false, <laughs> right? Not, no dogs or cows. Well, there are some dogs that are very, very fat, but even those ones aren't actually cows, right? It's a, it's a problematic argument structure, um, invalid, and that's why this argument is, is wrong, but it's a deductive kind of argument. They're trying to guarantee the conclusion. Studies show that most hate groups have some of the nicest people, as long as you aren't the focus of their hate. The Ku Klux Klan is a hate group, so it probably has very nice members. So what kind of argument is this that we're dealing with, right? The kind of argument that we're dealing with is an inductive argument, right? Because it's trying to show studies tell us this. And we have good reason for that. Now, the problem is, A, the, we're not sure what studies there are. Some people, sometimes you just get people saying, yeah, studies show this. Well, what studies, right? There might be like a study that tries to indicate this. 
and we can't evaluate that. We can't evaluate this claim based on there just being one study because it might be a very, very small sample, right? Like, and so it might be really flawed in that way. Um, but furthermore, the problem, like the problems in this argument, have to be looked at in the premises, right? We have to look and see. Oh, here's where the problems are. These premises are so messed up, and they're they're problematic, and they don't actually prove what they're supposed to prove, right? So it's an inductive argument, and where we would go to find the problems with this kind of argument are in the premises, right? So if Hitler had gone to art school, then he never would have gone to war, and therefore not sustained the injuries and acquired the military training to ascend to the top of the Nazi party. All right, so with this argument, is it inductive or deductive, do you think? So this argument, we probably want to say inductive. And the question, again, is about could the conclusion be false, even if the premises are all true, right? And I have a little star by this one because part of this has to do with your conception of history itself. If you think that the world is fundamentally... Um, faded or deterministic, right? That things that happened in the past had to happen that way and could have only happened that way. If that is true, if that is true about history and how history unfolds, then this argument is actually deductive, right? Because these were necessary causes for Hitler doing this thing, right? And if those changed, then you would have a different outcome, right? But if we're not sure about that, if we're not sure about that con conception of history, then we can't prove that Hitler, we can't prove conclusively, right? It can't be the case that we can definitively say that, yes, even if he had gone to art school, Hitler um, wouldn't have gone into um, the Nazi party stuff, right? He might have still done that, right? He might have done it in a different way, right? He might have been... I mean, terrible thought. He might have been more effective, even if he had gone to Arsenal. Like, there's all these other pops possibilities. It's it's totally open, it seems, right? And so we'd have to evaluate this as an inductive argument, right? Where we can only get kind of probabilistic argument reasons in favor of one conclusion or the other, right? Okay. So I want to spend a little bit of time just talk talking about uh, fallacies and... The structure of them, um, a few examples of common fallacies that we use, or I should say that are used by others that we can point out. And it's worth mentioning that fallacies are way, uh, they're types of arguments that can seem persuasive or convincing, but are actually fundamentally flawed, right? Um, a all of these fallacies, I, I think all the ones that we're going to look at, they are inductive fallacies. So they can't be evaluated simply because they're, they're the structure of the argument itself is, is um, flawed. It's arguments that usually generate likely or, or are attempting to generate likely conclusions, um, but where they go wrong is in a certain way of trying to prove that conclusion, right? So... These are, these are problematic strategies for trying to prove a particular claim, I guess is the maybe the best way to, to put um, what a fallacy is, right? And there's a whole host of fallacies. There's tons of different ones. But we're going to go through a few different patterns of strategies for trying to prove our um, conclusions that are um, really flawed and problematic. So if you come across these, what you should, what you can say is that that argument commits a fallacy, and therefore the argument doesn't prove the conclusion. You can't, you can't justify saying that the conclusion is false because the argument committed a fallacy. And the reason why is because we can make bad arguments for true conclusions, right? I can give you, I mean, for, for example, um, cows are mammals and um, 
and produce methane in the air and methane um, makes people green. Therefore, the sky looks blue, right? That's a stupid, ridiculous argument. But the point is that my premises do not have anything to do with the color of the sky. So we would say it's a bad argument, right? It's, it, it doesn't actually prove the conclusion. But the conclusion is still true. The sky does appear blue to us, right? So you can have bad arguments, but that doesn't mean that the conclusion is necessarily false, right? What it does mean is that that argument didn't prove the conclusion. So we need to go back and look at other arguments for why the conclusion could be the case, or look at arguments for why the opposite conclusion is the case, right? So when we're looking at fallacies, it's worth keeping that in mind. When we say that an argument has committed a fallacy, what that means is that argument doesn't prove the conclusion it's aiming to do so, right? And that's all we can really say at that point. Okay. And looking at this particular group of fallacies, we're looking at fallacies of relevance. So this is where irrelevant information is brought in to use to justify a conclusion. Right? Um, a couple, of, a few examples of this uh, appeal to force, appeal to pity, and appeal to the people. Um, these are all pretty common ones. Um, but I want to go through a couple others that are more specific, um, in particular the ad hominem, right? So an ad hominem is an argument based on discrediting or attacking irrelevant features or characteristics of a person, right? So if we, if you, a lot of times you'll find this in political discourse or political dialogue where you'll have a politician, rather than explaining why the argument given by the other politician for whatever policy they're arguing for, rather than say why that policy isn't a good one because of this and that reason, or try to kind of evaluate the reasons given for why this policy, why the person thinks the policy is good, what they'll do is say this person is out of their mind, or they're, um, they're this and this and this, or they're biased, or this and this and this. They'll talk about particular characteristics of the person who's telling you the argument, rather than telling you why the argument is bad in itself, right? So this is a kind of ad hominem attack, uh, approach, right? And they're trying to distract you with looking at what kind of person that is that's telling you these claims, right? Um, rather than looking at the claims themselves and evaluating the arguments. So ad hominems happen a lot, and it's easy to fall into the trap of finding them persuasive, because some cases it's really problematic, right? <laughs> it sounds really bad. Um, but we have to keep in mind that an ad hominem is committed not when a person's characteristics are called into question, but when the irrelevant characteristics are appealed to, right? When, when the characteristics that are cited have nothing to do with the claims being made by that person, right? So let's look at this example. Um, do you think this would count as an ad hominem attack? Many of the mothers that refuse to immunize their children are not qualified to make such medical judgments. They ought to listen instead to the medical experts that deny such a link, right? Is this an ad hominem? Because it's, it, it's pointing to the fact, the characteristic that mothers have of not being medical experts, right? Having no background in medicine, right? And the question here is, is this an ad hominem? In other words, is it, are they pointing to irrelevant features of these people with the, regard to the claims that they're making, right? Um, arguably, no, right? This is a, these are relevant features, right? They don't have a medical background, and so their ability to comment on the medical aspects of, um, of vaccines or immunizations, it's, it is relevant, right? That these are not trusted authorities <laughs> on such issues and we shouldn't, we shouldn't put their preferences and ideas over that of somebody who has studied for a long time and is very familiar with the nature of these things, right?
So, I mean, and it's worth saying that all this means is that when we're trying to figure out whether whether there's a real problem with the vaccine or an immunization, we shouldn't just rely on a person who has no medical background but is very loud, right? We should rely on medical experts, people who know what they're talking about. Same thing with engineers, right? You don't ask your Uncle Jerry who <laughs> to like um, whether a certain kind of construction project for a house is is gonna is gonna go well or be fine, right? No, you want to talk to an engineer, right? And if Jerry says, "Ah, oh, those engineers don't know what they're talking about," well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> he's not an engineer, right? So, people who have authority and have experience and have knowledge, they're the ones we want to get other knowledge from with the relevant issues, right? So, it's not that parent. It's not that mothers can't make decisions for their kids, right? It's not that they shouldn't be able to choose, right? That's not part of the claim here. Um, part of the, the the claim here is about um, what we should think about the safety of immunizations with regard to children with these vaccinations with regard to children, right? And this this question, I wrote this question or this claim, this example a while ago, right? four or five years ago. So this uh, this is pre-pandemic. And this has been an issue with vaccines and, and certain people for a long time, right? Um, based off of a very flawed and, um, and purposefully uh, mis miscalculated uh, study that, perf that claimed to show some connection between autism and certain vaccinations, but they're actually was no evidence that was really ha made by it. Um, so keep that in mind with ad hominem attacks. It's about pointing to irrelevant features, not just any feature, but ir irrelevant features. And we have different forms. We have the abusive ad hominem, right, where you're just kind of calling somebody names to try to make them look uh, discreditable, uh, circumstantial, poisoning the well. Uh, this is when um, and certain politicians will do this as well. They'll say, um, this person is illegitimate or can't make a viable claim in this area. Or they'll kind of like undermine their legitimacy or authority. And then when they start giving you claims, psychologically you're primed to not really believe them. Even if what they're telling you is absolutely the truth. Even if what they're telling you is accurate. So circumstantial or poisoning the well is a really often used form of the ad hominem. Um, and the two quoque, like th <laughs> this is one where um, a lot of us when we were teenagers, uh, perhaps, uh, might have yelled something like this at our parents. We might have yelled something like, um, how can you criticize me for smoking cigarettes when you smoke a pack a day? Right? <sighs> or how can, how, how, how can you criticize me for being lazy when all you do is lay around the living room all day, something like that, right? Um, or how can you criticize me for not learning another language when you never learned one when you were in school, right? These are what the form or structure of these arguments is um, what you're telling me about the value or the problems in a certain way of behaving or acting. Um, you didn't take such advice, and therefore such advice is... Um, inadmissible or or a bad argument but when we unpack this a little bit it becomes clear that uh that's just a f unjustified way of reasoning it that doesn't actually prove anything and the reason is even if you have somebody who still smokes and they tell you oh you shouldn't you shouldn't smoke you shouldn't start smoking they can still be right even if they themselves continue smoking. They actually might be in a better position to tell you <laughs> what not to do and why not to get in this habit because it might be very, it, it is very difficult to stop smoking if, after you've been smoking for a while, right? You have a kind of addiction that kind of creeps in, right? So, um, and that's a whole thing, right? With smoking cigarettes in particular, right? Um, so merely saying that you're wrong because you don't listen to the advice they're giving you. That's unjustified, and that's a fallacy. That's the two coke fallacy, right? Um, 
because they could have valuable insight, valuable ideas. You have to actually listen to the argument and judge it from there, right? So the ad populum, this is an argument where we make a statement true or false based on whether a majority or a substantial number of people believe it, right? So we used to make the argument that, um, I mean, you might say today, you might give the argument if you ever come across a flat earther or something, you might say something like, oh, the earth has to be round, right? And the reason you might give is, well, so many people believe it, right? So many people believe the earth is round. Now, what you've done there is you've committed an ad populum fallacy, right? The kind of argument you're giving for a true conclusion, but the kind of argument you're giving is a fundamentally problematic strategy for arguing for that conclusion, right? And the big reason is because, look, people used to give that same kind of argument for the Earth being flat, right? 2,000, 3,000 years ago, people might have said something like, oh, how can you believe the Earth is round? Everybody believes it's flat. <laughs> The, and this just goes to show, to go back to the kind of nature of truth, this just goes to show that the truth or the fact of the matter has nothing to do with our personal ideas or personal preferences about what something is like, right? The shape of the earth is not dependent on what we as humans believe, but what physical material and laws structure it to be, right? And this, yeah. This the example I give here is an equally problematic example, right? Evolution by natural selection as a theory isn't true because a lot of people believe it, or even because a lot of scientists believe it. It's true because it explains the phenomena, the relevant phenomena, in the best possible way, in the most, um, in a way better than any other theory, right, that we have available. Okay. It's composition fallacy. This is a fallacy where an argument tries to make a cl claim that what is true of the parts is true of the whole, when there's actually kind of a disconnect, right? So we say all of the pieces of this thing have this feature. Therefore, the whole must also have this thing, right? So to give you an example here, everything that we come into contact on Earth shows irrefutable signs of design. Therefore, excuse me, therefore, the whole universe is designed, right? Um, even if a lot of the pieces or a lot of the things we see on Earth show um, design, that doesn't mean that everything in the universe necessarily shows design, right? So part of it is that we might have a small sample. And we might not be able to make the judgment from that. But another thing is that claims about the totality of something or the whole of something don't necessarily reduce to just claims about their parts, right? I mean, for instance, you can you as a person are conscious, but and and like you're, let's just say that you're made out of atoms, right? We'll just keep it simple. You're made out of atom. Does that mean that every atom in you is also conscious? Well, no, not necessarily, right? So it wouldn't be and. It go, and the composition fallacy is when you're do, when you're making the argument from the atom level to then say something about the human being as a whole, right? Um, you could say that atoms are small, tiny, and microscopic. All atoms are like that. And human beings are only made out of atoms, so therefore humans are tiny, microscopic uh, entities. <laughs> no, that would be false, right? And that's a fallacy. It sounds convincing when you just put it that way, right? All of the parts of this thing have this feature. Therefore, the whole thing that has all these pieces must also have this feature, right? Well, no, that's not true, actually. That's a, that's a flawed, kind of fall, uh, fallacious way of arguing, right? One, uh, and the, part of the reason why the composition fallacy um, goes wrong is because it's not taking into account other prominent features or other important characteristics that problematize the whole having that feature, right? And the, the, it doesn't take into account important differences between the, uh, the whole of something and the piece that you're looking at, right? 
But there are some cases where we can kind of make this something that sounds like this argument, but it's actually a perfectly fair argument. The difference is that there is no other relevant piece that you need to look at in order to evaluate the argument, right? So every part of the house is made of wood, therefore the house, whole house is made of wood. Well, if there are no other pieces than that, right? If there's nothing, no other characteristics to look at, and every single piece of the house, like literally every single piece of the house is wood, then the whole house has to be made of wood. That has to follow, right? Deductively. So you can get, um, you just have to kind of be careful in looking at this and looking at these kinds of arguments because you have to be asking, well, is there a way for the whole to have a different um, characteristic, even if it has all these other um, individual properties with these things, right? And that's how you avoid the composition fallacy. The division fallacy is the way that I was talking about going the other direction, starting from the whole and then saying it's true of all the parts, right? So we could say the student body is roughly half male and half female. Therefore, each student is roughly half male and half female, right? That would be a fallacious argument. And the problem that we're um, committing there is trying to go from the whole to something that all the parts have to have, right? Um, when we make these part whole arguments, we have to explain also why this part also can apply to the whole and why this characteristic of the whole can also apply to the parts, right? We have to go into a little more um, detail with that. So equivocation, this is an important fallacy where the argument relies upon using a word or phrase in two different ways to establish the conclusion, right? So these can be pretty sneaky. And when we're dealing with kind of like some kind of buzzwords or common words that we think we know the under uh, the meaning of and understand, right? So people who use the word freedom, they can use the word freedom in many different senses and generate a conclusion, an argument by using that. But if we break down what they mean by freedom, it might become pretty clear that the premises that they're giving are talking about very different things, right? So they're bringing in irrelevant conceptions or definitions of freedom to the point that they're trying to make, right? So here's an example for an equivocation. Some triangles are obtuse. Whatever is obtuse is ignorant. Therefore, some triangles are ignorant, <laughs> right? Um, go back. Where we go wrong here, right, is this word obtuse, right? Obtuse is a way of characterizing a specific mathematical formulation or formation of a triangle, right? It's a way lines are organized as a triangle. That's a certain use of that. And obtuse, in this other way, is a um, means ignorance, right? Means that's um, being stubbornly uh, resistant to um, contradicting evidence or something like that, right? And the conclusion here is generated because we're using two different meanings of the word, right? So straw man, this is an important kind of argument um, type where we have a, a intentional or possibly even unintentional, but we have a misrepresentation of someone else's argument put in a simplistic and weaker form um, that makes their argument absurd, right? So um, a while back ago, um, Sarah Palin, this is one of the claims, one of the arguments that she made. And when she made this argument, there was no credible connection to there being death panels. There was nothing in the, um, this is a, by the way, this is a claim she made about the American um, Health Care Act, right? Amer uh, Americans for Affordable Care Act, right? So affordable, the Affordable Care Act, which established the um, the uh, health insurance available through the government, right? And she said that there would be death panels that decide on whether le le uh, <laughs> whether less productive members of society are put to death than are given health care, right? Nothing in the nothing nothing in the Affordable Care Act mentions anything about death panels. Not, and not just because they don't use that phrase. There are no panels which decide, which convene, which decide 
these people get health care and these people don't get health care, right? There's, there's no such thing, right, in, in the legislation itself. So this was an attempt to distract from the actual arguments and reasoning behind developing this legislation and try to paint it as some kind of scary, ridiculous, terrible thing that it wasn't, right? It just objectively was not this thing. And we've had it for a few, for what, five, five, six years now, or longer than that. And you haven't seen any of this. <laughs> and so clearly this wasn't part of the, part of the legislation, right? It was just a, a scare tactic. And straw men's are often used as creating scare attacks, but they have to misrepresent the argument in order to um, use that scare tactic. And this goes to something that we should keep in mind when we're evaluating arguments. The principle of charity. It's a really it's really important to try and figure out what is the best and most justified form formulation of an argument. When we're, when we're restructuring someone's argument, we want to make sure that we're not taking the weakest form of the argument because then we're not really testing whether the conclusion is true. What we're do all we're doing is like going through the motions and saying, oh, this is a dumb idea, right? But if we haven't really tested the strongest reasons for why something could be true, then we can't really be sure that we've eliminated that as a, as a possibility for being true, right? Um, we want to be charitable. And remember, because what we're doing is we're trying to figure things out together. We're trying to collaborate and cooperate to try and come to some conclusion about these things, right? So keep in mind the principle of charity, which is, you ought to interpret or restructure an argument in the most favorable terms possible. Favorable, favorable here meaning something like ways that sound or appear um, most promising or most likely to be true, right? Or lead to a true conclusion, right? The strongest form of the argument. We really ought to take the strongest form of each argument that we can, right? Um, all right, so red herring, you might have heard this phrase before, but you might not have uh, kind of understood what it was, but it's an argument that diverts attention from the conclusion um, being argued for by surrounding the conclusion with irrelevant information. Right? Um, a lot of advertising does this, right? Almost any TV, TV commercial. Um, <laughs> and if, if you ever wondered why, um, why do they include models with cheeseburgers or these kinds of food items that they would never eat, right? Might even be contractually um, pr prohibited from eating because of their appearance or whatever, right? Um, they don't actually eat those that food, but what does that have to do with the food being good, right? <laughs> um, what does that have to do with it, right? Um, a lot of the commercials for like Geico does this also, right? Where it's like they're having like weird conversations about I don't know, going hiking or something like that. And then it's a, a commercial about insurance. It's like, what? Right? What does that have to do with whether the insurance is affordable, efficiently priced, whether it's reliable, whether it's useful? Um, None of that information is relevant to <laughs> whether you should do that, right? So um, advertising a lot of time involves red herrings, for sure. So we can do a little practice here, and you can try to figure out what you think in these cases, right? So. Um, Old Man Brown claims that he saw a flying saucer in his farm, but he never got beyond the fourth grade in school and can hardly read or write. He's completely ignorant of what scientists have written on the subject, so his report cannot possibly be true. So go ahead and pause this if you want to um, try and guess yourself. But um, what this argument most likely commits as a fallacy is the ad hominem, right? It's calling, it's just um, whether somebody saw or experience something doesn't really rely on how far they got in school, right? Even people who have never been to school can still make accurate reports on what they've experienced or seen, right? Now, whether he can 
whether he whether we could should believe a dissertation he writes <laughs> on the nature of alien life and all this other stuff yeah that's probably suspicious right so it might be relevant to say well he's never actually completed all this other schoolwork that has to deal with how you um how you do accurate thorough scientific work um but if but the claim being made here is that we shouldn't believe his claim about seeing a flying saucer because he hasn't finished school. Well, that doesn't, that's irrelevant to him. I mean, it would, it would be, it would be relevant if you said we shouldn't believe him because he doesn't have eyes <laughs> or he's blind or something like that. Okay. Well, that would be relevant, but just saying that he didn't finish fourth grade, that's not a relevant con characteristic in this case. Right. So, so we seem to have a, an ad hominem going on here. All right. Officer, please excuse my going over the speed limit, but my mother is ill and I'm being audited by the IRS and I don't know how I can meet all my bills. Right? Um, this argument is, it's, there's a kind of a, there's actually an implicit conclusion um, because the way it's phrased is as a request and requests are not statements, right? But we could reformat, we could restructure and reformulate the request in terms of you should let me off of this ticket, right? You should excuse my going over the speed limit, right? So you ought to allow, you ought to um, excuse my going over the speed limit because my mother is ill, I'm being audited by the IRS, and I don't know how I can meet all my bills, right? So when put in that way, the argument most likely looks like a red herring or appeal to emotion, right? Or appeal to pity, sometimes called. Um, red herring here, all of these things are irrelevant as to whether you broke the law <laughs> in this case, right? So if you say you should be allowed to do that without getting a ticket, then you're saying something about these being somehow relevant reasons, but they're not, right? They're not relevant as to why you should. They might be relevant to why you were speeding, right? They might explain why you were speeding, but they don't explain why you should not be punished for speeding, right? So red herring or an appeal to pity, right? Which is trying to say all these terrible things that are happening in your life, so don't don't give me a ticket, right? That's appeal to pity, right? Um, okay, but doctor, surely your advice that I should not drink coffee is not sound, since you yourself often drink coffee. So we've already covered this one a little bit. Um, it's a different version of the ad hominem, the two coke, right? Where he's like, well, I don't have to listen to your advice about laying off the co coffee doctor because you drink coffee, right? Well, that doesn't mean that they can't give you sound advice for <laughs> what you ought to be doing. Right? The present U.S. administration has not yet developed an energy policy. Nonetheless, almost every other developed nation in the world has an energy policy except us. Therefore, the United States should have a unified energy policy. All right, what do you think that this um, argument is committing as a fallacy? My go-to for this one, or what seems to explain the problem with this argument, is the kind of ad populum nature of it. It's trying to say we ought to go ahead and do something simply because all these other people are doing it, right? Now, this is one of those cases where the conclusion is probably true. We should have a unified energy policy. But the reason why is not because other countries do it. The reason why we should have a unified energy policy is because it'll be more efficient, it'll be more effective, it'll be less costly, it'll benefit people more. Like, we could give all these other reasons, and those are the reasons why we should have a unified energy policy, not just because everybody else does it, right? That's a bad line of reasoning for doing things, right? His house is about half the size of most houses in the neighborhood, therefore his doors must all be about three and a half feet high, right? So there's probably two that you're going between here, right? Uh, the composition and division fallacy, right? This one is division because we're talking about the totality of something and then applying it to the parts in that totality, right? So his house is the totality in relation to other houses in the neighborhood. And, there, and then we're saying the part of that whole right, has that feature as well. So that's some practice for those. And so we went over fallacies of 
irrelevance, and that's where we're dealing with irrelevant information. There's also fallacies of what we could call weak induction. And this is, these are fallacies where, or strategies of argumentation that really just don't provide a lot of strength or support to the conclusion, right? There are things that weaken or make the conclusion less likely to be true or just really don't help make the conclusion um, any more likely to be true, right? So for starters, um, we can talk to we can talk about this one, appeal to unqualified authority. So an argument that involves relying upon an authority or witness that lacks credibility, right? So somebody making a claim about something in an area that they're not an expert in, it doesn't actually make that claim, that conclusion, more likely to be true, right? It's it just is like a claim about it, right? We'd ha we'd want to go talk to a qualified authority <laughs> to see if that's accurate, right? So George Clooney believes that global warming is a serious problem. Therefore, we should create policies to reduce greenhouse gases. Now, again, the conclusion is probably true, right? That's a good thing we should be doing, but the reason is not because simply because George Clooney believes it, right? The reason is because there's a very, very large <laughs> um, consensus amongst climate scientists and other scientists that there is a problem with the global change climate crisis, right? Um, and we need, to, and it's going to affect a lot of people in lots of different ways, right? So it it's not it. We the problem here is that George Clooney saying it doesn't have anything to do with his expertise, which isn't acting, right? If this was a argument about how we can become actors or what we should do to act well, well, then he's a qualified authority, right? But not being a qualified authority, again, it doesn't make the conclusion false. It just doesn't help make the conclusion any more likely to be true, right? If you're dealing with an unqualified authority. Uh, appeal to ignorance. This is an argument where we rely on the absence of contradictory evidence to support a conclusion. And again, what we have here is claims that aren't actually making the conclusion any more likely to be true, right? It's exact. It's just as true as when we didn't have the claim <laughs> that was being held, right? So an example of this, classical example, you cannot prove that God doesn't exist, therefore we can infer that God does exist, right? The conclusion that God does exist can't be more likely to be true because we don't have available contradicting evidence, right? If I say to you, there's an elephant in your parking lot or in your driveway right now, and you can't give me contradicting evidence, well, the fact that there's no contradicting evidence doesn't prove that there's an elephant in your garage, driveway, or parking lot right now, right? Um, so appeal to ignorance is a flawed strategy for giving any kind of justification to other um, conclusions, right? So uh, something worth thinking about here with regard to appeal to ignorance is what about risk aversion, right? When we generally rely on the fact that we don't know something as being reason to not act on this as much, right? Um, what we want to think is... With regards to risk aversion, it's it's the fact that we're uncertain that makes our choices less um, clear, right, or less decisive, right, and that's perfectly fair. But the problem with appeal to ignorance is that the burden of proof, right, when we talk about burden of proof, it's a it's on the person giving the argument, right. When we're being risk averse or whether we should be risk averse, that's when we're acting, we're, we're trying to make an argument as to what we ought to do given the data that we have, right? We haven't made the argument yet. That's what being risk averse is, right? But when we're looking at a fallacy with the appeal to ignorance, we're actually doing a, we're evaluating an argument that's given. And so the burden of proof is on the other person giving the argument to show us why the reasons that they're giving lead to the conclusion that we have, right? Uh, hasty generalization, you might have come across this one before. This is a pretty common uh, fallacy. It's where the argument makes a general claim about a group 
based on too small of a sample. Now, question that comes up often is, what is too small of a sample size? And the answer to that is that it is <laughs> relative. It's dependent on what you're evaluating, right? So if we are going to make a claim about our class of 30 students, then we would need to make a argument. We need a sample size that's large enough to represent that number, right? We don't have to do everyone in the class, right? But we have to do at least more than half, right? But if we were doing making a claim about the college itself, it wouldn't make any sense to say, oh, well, we just have a sample size of this class, right? Well, that's not remotely close to the number of people who are at the college. So we can't justify that. It would be too quick to make that kind of conclusion, right? Um, and so an example here that we can give, while visiting London, it rained the whole two days we were there. It must rain there all the time, right? Now, I hear that in London it actually does rain a lot of the time, right? but you wouldn't be able to justify that simply by looking at two days out of the year that you were there, right? There's 365 days in each year. Um, two days out of the year is not enough of a sample size to really make that claim, right? Another category of fallacies that we can look at is um, are broadly called unacceptable premises. Right? So we have a um, begging the question here. This is sometimes called a circular argument. Um, and they're arguments that leave out key premises or assume the conclusion within the argument already. Right? The circular arguments are the ones that have the conclusion kind of built into the argument already. And so let me give you couple of examples of this. So murder is never justified. Therefore, no war can ever be just. One way of thinking about it in this case is that war, an implicit premise, right, actually is that in this argument, is that war involves murder, right? Well, murder, uh, war involves killing, but it doesn't necessarily involve murder, right? Murder is a very specific kind of killing. It's one way of defining it is illegitimate killing, right? But if you've been given um, approval to go to war, well, then we would be talking about what we might call legitimate killing, right? Killing in self-defense isn't murder. We might call it legitimate killing, right? So killing and murder are not the same thing. And we might be leaving out key premises here, right? And this is what's going on in this first one. Right? So the paragraph, so this conclusion here, right? The paragraph is well written, is already here. It's literally written here. Paragraph is well written. So every sentence is, so it's it's built into the premise already. And so we're we're not. And the problem with begging the question is that we're not really proving something new. Right, we're, we're we're just kind of restating something that's already in the premises. Um, we're not proving anything new with the conclusion, right? and so we don't get any new insights into the world through that way. Um, another one that's um, kind of important and common, and a lot of time, uh, very common or more common that we should we should expect or hope, but it's an argument that assumes there are only two possibilities when in fact there are far more options. Right, false dilemma, false dichotomy. So here's an example. Either we require the forced sterilization of third world peoples, or the world population will explode and all of us will die. We certainly don't want to die, so we must require forced sterilization. So what's the problem with this argument? Well, the problem is that we don't just have these two options, right? <laughs> we can um, we can create new food sources. We can make our uh, food sources are in agriculture more efficient, more effective, right? We don't have just this or the other option, right? It's very rare that in, in, in situations we only have two options, right? Um, there's usually a lot of different options that are possible, what, but we only want to explore maybe two, right? So it's worth keeping in mind that there are, that in most cases we don't only have two options, right? There are three or four or five or ten or twenty, right? Um, and in those cases, we want to really avoid this kind of false dichotomy um, because it can be really convincing and powerful if we get 
kind of trapped in the mindset that there are only two options, um, we need to be able to realize, oh no, these aren't the only two options actually, right? A slippery slope, this is this is an important argument um, fallacy form because it's, it's used a lot and it's hard to kind of call it out when it is used that way. But it it takes it takes its strength by talking about a kind of chain sequence of events, right? If we start doing this, then this will happen, then this will happen, and we'll get to this crazy situation at the end, right? So I'll give you an example here. If you don't drink Coca-Cola, then none of your friends will either, and then none of their friends and family members will drink Coca-Cola, and pretty soon the whole company will go under, and we will all be left with a soda monopoly. Therefore, you should drink Coca-Cola. <laughs> Um, what a convincing ad campaign that would be to use this. Um, there's also, I don't know if you've ever seen these commercials or remember these commercials, but uh, there's, I think it was uh, DirecTV had these commercials where, like, you had somebody who, like, got frustrated at the remote, and it's like, if you don't have DirecTV, you get frustrated at your remote. If you get frustrated at your remote, you do things um, to let out your anger, and he throws the remote, and it hits him in the eye, gives him an eye patch, and then if you do that, then people will take, um, will think you're looking for a fight because he has an eye patch, and he gets into trouble and gets into fights, and then you're going to be um, taken advantage of by these bullies and beaten up, right? So get direct TV and don't get beaten up, right? <laughs> so that's the kind of slippery slope argument that was given. It, it was meant as a joke, but it is an, it is an example of a slippery slope kind of argument, right? Where and the problem that we get here is where it's not clear that there's actually a real reason to think that these causal sequences will happen that lead to the end result that they're talking about, right? We want to evaluate, okay, is it true that if I don't drink a Coca-Cola that none of my friends will and none of my family members will? No. I don't even really drink Coca-Cola that much, but other people do, right? <laughs> other people still drink Coca-Cola. So, um, the where the problem happens with slippery slopes, it's not that you can't make um, like causal sequence arguments, right? The problem with the slippery slope is that the actual connection between the different causal chains is very weak and not really acceptable. Like there's no reason to accept why this chain should be there, right? Um, last one here we get is a faulty analogy. Analogy is when we compare two different things and try to say, oh, because these things are so similar and this other thing has this feature, then this other then this other thing we're comparing it with must also have that feature, right? If you look, um, sometimes we do this with uh, with cars, right? Um, that's actually the example that I have, right? You should buy a Kia. They are made in Japan, and Honda and Toyota are Japanese companies that are well known to make very reliable cars, right? So. What's the analogy here? Well, the analogy is between um, Kia and um, Honda and Toyota. And the feature that's being compared between them is that they are Japanese companies, right? Now, the problem is that, that they share that, right? They are related to that. But um, the problem is that there are other characteristics that are involved, other features of these different cars that make them dis-analogical, right? That are not closely compared, right? So like where the factories are built, where the factories are made, the pay of the employees, how thorough their inspection process is, right? The kind of resources and materials that they have available to use. They're not the same, right? Um, and those differences might be really, really important differences that make the analogy problematic. Right? Um, when you're making an argument from analogy, you want the analogy to be as close as possible so that you're not kind of missing out on things that would characterize a really important difference between the two things, right? So you want to be really careful that way with the faulty analogy. And these are just, stra again, these are strategies or patterns of reasoning that give us problematic or flawed arguments. And we don't say the conclusion is false necessarily, we just say that the argument is problematic. All right, so I hope this made sense. I hope that this gives you a kind of um, good 
background for the nature and structure of arguments and how to evaluate them um, over the semester when we're looking at different arguments in philosophy. Um, so we'll keep working on it through there. Um, take care and uh, have a great rest of the week.